Egeo. Architectoniques uh, Alepidrasis, uh, Sin Archea, Macedonia, Timforia Elada, Tithraki, Ketis Pontia, uh, Pontia Kes, Perioches, Sin Isteri, Classic Key, Ke Elenisti Key, Periodo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Bonna Westcote, Director of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and it's an honor to welcome you this evening and for the next two days to the symposium Beyond the Northern Aegean, Architectural Interactions Across Ancient Macedonia, Northern Greece, Thrace, and the Pontic regions in the late classical and Hellenistic periods. The fact that we are having this symposium three years after the scheduled end of the project is a reflection of world conditions which have not abated. Our heart goes out to our colleagues and their families in Ukraine and now Turkey and Syria. I would like to call for a moment of silence in their honor. Thank you. Okay. Beyond the Northern Aegean was created as part of the Getty Foundation's initiative, Connecting Art Histories. The program is grounded in the conviction that, and I quote, the power and vitality of any scholarly discipline rests on its ability to forge connections among people and ideas and across international boundaries. Connecting Art Histories aims to strengthen the discipline of art history globally and increase opportunities for sustained intellectual exchange across national and regional borders. The initiative springs from the recognition that art history uh, develops fresh lines of inquiry when scholars from diverse regions, career stages, and academic training are able to inform each other's ideas and methodologies." Unquote. Our Connecting Art Histories Beyond the Northern Aegean, conceived in 2018, has aimed to bring together scholars at different career stages from Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, Iran, Italy, France, and the United States. Architectural historians, archeologists, historical geographers, and historians of material culture all of whom share a fascination with the power of ancient Greek architectural design to connect the far-flung communities of the ancient Greek world and to forge a powerful means of communication between these communities and their neighbors. Thrace and the Black Sea Littoral, areas that bordered and interacted with the Greek world but were not subsumed by it, offered an excellent opportunity to examine the creative dissemination appropriation, interaction, and adaptation of Greek architectural ideas across a wide range of polyethnic communities and geographic circumstances north and northeast of the Aegean Sea. By joining scholars working, uh, uh, working in several modern countries that now encompass the northern Aegean, Thracian, and Pontic regions, the program aimed to promote the collaborative study of ancient Greek architecture from a perspective that reinstates the centrality of ancient regional factors, land, sea, and people, and contemporary innovative methods of research from investigation of design transmission, decorative ornamentation, uh, and te uh, technologies to experimental archeology, span 3D modeling, and place studies, to investigate how and why diverse ancient communities north of the Aegean shared, adapted, and transformed ancient Greek architectural ideas uh, to meet personal, civic, political, and spiritual aims. The members of our symposium chose to explore several key themes that will inform the core of this symposium this weekend, including architectural interactions across diverse ethnic and political communities, uh, adaptation and persistence of traditions in the face of geographic diversity, design confluences and divergences, architecture and cult, architecture and death, iconography, ornament, and architecture in color, technologies of construction, and transporting and trading materials and ideas across regions. To capture it all, we decided on the title, 
beyond the northern Aegean. The long arc of world circumstances that led the Getty to see the need for connecting art history has had a strong impact on our mission. Our program was to be a two-year travel seminar. In 2019, we started from the ancient capital of the Macedonian Kingdom, sweeping across northern Greece, Thassos, Samothrace, up the Evros River to the Black Sea, and the settlements of Mesemvria and Apollonia Pontica, and then across the central valley of ancient Thrace to Sofia. It was an extraordinary and virtually flawless trip. For, year, for the second year, a summer of 2020, our plans were even more ambitious. We planned to start in Bucharest, follow the Black Sea coast from Histria and Calatus to Svestari and Dionysopolis, and then the eastern side of the Evros River with Ainos, the Thracian side of the Sea of Marmara, the Troad, and then Ukraine to Olbia, Berezin Island, Odessa, and Kiev. But you all know what happened. We ended up on Zoom. And it was something of a lifeline. When COVID prevented our travel in 2020, and then again in 2021, we were fortunate to have wonderful colleagues who shared their knowledge of sites that we had planned to visit and others, other ones in remote seminars. We are deeply grateful to these scholars for sharing their expertise. Anka Don, Alfred Stroy, Monica Marigino Caristiu, Letitia Nistor, Julian Birescu, Adam uh, Rabinowitz, Mar uh, Maria Magdalena Stefan, Sayat Basharan, Ma uh, Marina Koleva, uh, Nikolai Sharonkov, Daniela Soevna, and Lorian Martinez-Sev. Thank you. We were so glad to be able to remain connected, but if you look back at that Zoom photo, as I did just the other day, everyone's expression uh, makes it very clear that we're, it's good to be back in person once again. And now that we can also rely on Zoom to connect us as well. When we were stopped a third time uh, in 2022 by the outbreak of war between Russia and Ukraine and its effect on neighboring countries, we needed another way to bring our group together. The Getty agreed that we could use the opportunity of this symposium in Athens to come together as our seminar and share our ideas with each other and with you. I'm grateful to the participants of the seminar who have demonstrated a remarkable resilience and tenacity years after their initial commitment. I would also like to thank Chavdar Sochev, Amalia Avramidu, and Ellen Archie, uh, who have become honorary members of the seminar by virtue of their contribution to this symposium. Now, one of our key themes has been the persistence, adaptation, and transformation of traditions in the face of geographic diversity. And this goes to the heart of the work of our keynote speaker and seminar member, Anka Christina Don. Uh, Anka is a researcher of ancient history and archaeology in the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, CNRS, uh, and associate professor in the École Normale Supérieure, Paris. Her primary research interests center on the historical geography of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, investigated through the critical confrontation of maps and texts and the geoarchaeological data obtained and interpreted by the geophysicists, geomorphologists, geochemists, paleobiologists, uh, and archaeologists uh, with whom she collaborates. Her, work concerns, her current work concerns the reconstruction of ancient environments of Doriscos on the west side of the Evros River in Greece, and before that of Ainos on the east side of the river, modern-day Ainos in Turkey the Danube Delta as well in Romania, and the Taman Peninsula in Russia. Anka favors interdisciplinary and international collaboration in projects of 4D modeling of ancient sites for better understanding of the interaction between humans and nature. She is therefore the perfect scholar to open our program with her keynote address, Beyond the Northern Aegean, Setting the Stage, Spaces, Peoples, and Representations, throughout the Balkans and the Lower Danube Basin. Help me, join me in welcoming Anka.
Κυρίε και κύριοι, είμαι πάρα πολύ ευτυχισμένη να μιλήσω εδώ στο, στο, στο Αμερικανικό Σχολείο για τη γεωγραφία των περιοχών πέρα από το Βόρειο Αιγαίο και τα μιλήσω στα Αγγλικά, είναι καλύτερα για όλους, για μένα. So, um, thank you very much, Bona, for the very kind introduction. Thank you all of you who are here in order to uh, travel at least uh, with your minds like uh, the ancient people were doing most of the time in antiquity in fact the, those we are reading today so we are traveling in mind uh, behind the, the the northern aegean and um, i would like to start my presentation with a discussion we had uh, <laughs> with professor palagia on uh, facebook uh, the other day Uh, because many uh, uh, Greek uh, colleagues or uh, simply people on the Facebook were, were wondering why northern Greece is separated from Macedonia Trace and the Black Sea region. Uh, and uh, I was uh, as answering that uh, we defined these uh, uh, regions or they, they were defined in the title, uh, thinking of the uh, contemporary, so late classical, Hellenistic, up to early Roman definitions of those terms. So we do not pretend that Macedonia, Trace and Black Sea don't belong to Greece, at least to the Greece in our hearts for the Black Sea area. Uh, but uh, this is how a pseudo Skulax, uh, this uh, Aristotelic text from the uh, late fourth Uh, century BC is defining uh, uh, the, the, the Hellas first, which uh, goes uh, uh, until Ambrakia and uh, uh, until the uh, Peneion uh, uh, River. So you can see it here from the Ambracian Gulf to the Thermaic Gulf uh, here. So this is Hellas and we involved the northern Hellas, uh, so the northern Thessaly and northern Epirus uh, in the Epirus uh, in, uh, in our, let's say, interest area. And I will try to explain you through connectivity why and how we define this area. Uh, then we discuss about Macedonia, so starting from the Peneos Potamos uh, and the Thermaic Gulf uh, and going until uh, Strumon, the Strumon River where uh, Trace uh, uh, starts and go until the Black Sea. Well, like uh, Pseudo Skulax, uh, this uh, strange text, which uh, I think now found its peace with a date in the late 4th century BC, so between Philip II and Alexander the Great, is that uh, he presents a space a little bit like we had the chance to see it and to explore it uh, uh, thanks to Bona. Uh, because if you can follow the Periplus, it's not a real Periplus, so it's not a real boat. No Periplus is a real Periplus in antiquity. These are literary compilation in order to travel by mind in this guy in this case in uh, we imagine in a peripatetic aristotelic school in order to make an inventory of all the greek cities around the internal sea mediterranean plus the black sea in the moment of the alexander of alexander conquests of the east so when the greek cities extend far beyond behind uh, the near east and uh, egypt alexandria in egypt is not uh, mentioned nor any other foundation of alexander or the diadochi so this text is interesting because it explores the space, the mental space, just like we did. So following the coast, mentioning the Greek city in order to see the monuments, we are in a seminar for architecture, uh, but uh, also uh, mentioning the connective uh, links, in particular the harbors and everything which relates to the harbor, so in particular the, uh, the islands uh, and with their ports. So you can see here the mentioning, so uh, he, he explores Macedonia and then uh, uh, Trace and he leaves the coast and he goes to Tassos and then uh, he does the same when he goes to Samothrace, exactly as we did. So I wanted to put here the, the passage on Samothrace, so Nes of Skyliman with the island with the, the harbor, uh, and then goes back to the territory, to the pariah of the Samothrace, enumerating the uh, sites which are still uh, debated for the identification, except Zoni, which is now uh, uh, sure. Then the uh, Potamos Hebros with the, 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 uh, the ancient maritime gulf, uh, and then uh, uh, Doriscos, then crossing to Ainos, and so on. So we, we see here uh, go and forth uh, between islands, uh, uh, cities, rivers, and so on, exactly as we tried to do it. Uh, 
And then the Periplus uh, goes uh, through the Hellespont to the Black Sea, following again the coast, enumerating the, uh, the Greek cities, mentioning their Hellenicity, and it's a very interesting point, why they are Greek and they, why they matter also for us, a center of uh, uh, spreading, uh, let's say, Hellenism, and we'll try to understand, in any case, this is also our purpose, to see, say, how this kind of Hellenization of cultural uh, metissage or transfer culturel uh, uh, are working in the area, and then making the whole, at the end of the text, we have a, a whole sum of what all this trace uh, means. I had a, a lot of difficulties to map the trace uh, of uh, Pseudosculax, because in fact, except modern maps, this does not correspond to any real political definition in antiquity. We can say that it is more or less the Odrysian zone, the Odrysian state and the Odrysian influence zone, but the Odrysian state does not, goes, uh, does not go until the Danube. So it's uh, really a geometrical conception which is not uh, uh, political, but uh, rather, let's say, uh, geometrical and, uh, after Eratosthenes, geographical. In fact, we have to go to modern maps in order to have a, a complete map of the ancient trace, and uh, we'll start with Abraham Ortelius in the 16th century, who compiles all the ancient maps, and in particular, uh, Ptolemy. So, also modern maps in order to see ancient uh, trace, or rather modern maps in order to uh, map the Roman regions, because this is the key. This is the key to the only moment when the ancient people conceptualized all this region in as a region, and it is the frontier region uh, of the Romans with the construction of the so-called uh, limes. So we have here on this map the provincial development in Illyricum, Mesia, and Trace. So this is more or less what interests uh, us uh, uh, here. We have also, again, modern maps in order to reconstruct ancient, and in this case, uh, medieval uh, realities with this uh, Bulgarian uh, empire in the 13th century. So you see it covers also this, uh, this uh, so to say, previous uh, Thracian uh, uh, very, in a very large sense uh, region. And I told you that indeed the Romans uh, made, so to say, a map and uh, tried to identify the region as we try to do it now. And they did it because it is the, the frontier. And we have here the tabula nona, the ninth table of uh, Ptolemy Europe, uh, where you can see exactly the two things about which I will uh, tell you more in the next minutes, uh, which are the main elements of this area. So the Danube and the uh, very complicated chains of mountains of what we call today uh, Balkans uh, in a large sense. The fact that this is a frontier zone, it's obvious also for the linguists who are familiar with this uh, Girecek uh, line between the Latin influence and the Greek influence. It is contested. It is not uh, a good <laughs> definition. Uh, now uh, we, we know it, but uh, let's say that uh, this uh, shows that at least until the 20th century, this uh, idea that uh, behind the Northern Aegean we have a frontier uh, between two words, if not the end of the Aegean world, it is something very well established in the minds of uh, nearly everyone studying uh, antiquity. Uh, I was telling you that uh, for the Romans, this was the frontier, a frontier to nowhere. So because we can uh, look at the map as late as uh, the Tabula Peutingeriana, which was originally put into one piece, let's say, uh, uh, probably in the fourth century AD. And we can see that the Danube is the last uh, limit to the Roman world in which, each, which in this case is defined by the roads. So it is a road map and the roads are finishing at the Danube. Danube. There are not road, roads and river roads behind the Danube. Uh, and we can see that also in this uh, uh, mental image of the 4th century AD, so copied, of course, in the beginning of the, uh, the 13th century uh, AD in the uh, medieval West, uh, and here in the 19th century copy of Miller, uh, we, the Danube is uh, doubled by uh, mountains, uh, uh, mountainous ranges in order to show that there are still some roads there military roads for the frontier, but there is nothing behind the, uh, the Danube. So we are really at the end of the world, an image which is comforted by all the Roman uh, geographical uh, tradition. 
Of course, uh, the Romans had uh, maps of regions and they knew that there is something behind the Danube. And uh, the best proof is the best map we preserve today, which is sure, it's not uh, contested. This is the so-called Dura Europos shield preserved in the National Library in France. And uh, it is oriented to the south. And we can see here uh, the Romanian and Bulgarian coast of the Black Sea. So we are going here from, let's say, Ukraine. You can see here the Danube, Istros, uh, then Kalatis, uh, Bizone, Odessa and so on until uh, Bosporus. So this is 3rd century AD probably. It fits very well with the Periplus of uh, Arian. So the Romans had this kind of things and quite uh, uh, it was probably used as a, a decoration. Of course, we don't imagine the Romans the, the doing military campaigns with that, but uh, you know, like a prestige or a representation of a region where some military was before going to Dura Europos. Romans knew to make uh, maps and we have from these maps, unfortunately, in very late uh, echoes. So the beginning of the medieval times, like this Albi Mappa Mundi, which is oriented to the east. And you can see here Europe with our Aegean, let's say, and Black Sea. So we are here. Uh, with Greece, and uh, as always in ancient and medieval ca cartography, we have text and maps, and we can go from image to text and from text to image in order to complete uh, one with the other. And then uh, here, in a detailed regional map cut from a 5th century AD uh, late antique maps, just like this one, so the model is common, but uh, here we are in a regional cut of what it is the Orient, the Orient in the 12th century, so we are in the context of the uh, cru cru crusades. Uh, and what we can see here, so again, orientation to the east. Uh, here is Asia Minor, and here is uh, our Greece uh, from the Aegean, and the Aegean is here through the Straits, and this is uh, the Black Sea. So this is how it looks, the northern Aegean in uh, late Roman, model 5th century AD, and then um, medieval um, um, reception of this. Why I'm showing you this map, which was uh, associated with uh, here so it is in the British Museum now preserved in a small manuscript uh, because uh, it, it is a representation of the Christianization phenomenon and in particular on these maps we have uh, in this map we have mentions of the cities which were visited by Paul uh, in its, uh, his travels so Northern Aegean is a hot point let's say in connectivity because uh, um, Paul is traveling there from northwestern Asia Minor to uh, especially Macedonia and then uh, uh, to Greece. And then, because uh, it is the uh, earliest, so to say, regional map that I have found uh, cut more or less uh, containing what it is, uh, of course, the, the best um, map uh, <laughs> for Greece, uh, at least the first maps of uh, Riga's map uh, of uh, uh, northern, uh, uh, of uh, Riga's map of Greece, of all the Greece, so starting from Italy up to the Black Sea. Uh, and uh, we are with the northern Aegean uh, right uh, here. I'm showing this map of Rigas because I think it is m even more useful than we have the uh, usually the maps uh, because it puts uh, Greece, of course, in uh, Rigas terms. This is uh, the representation of the Greek Orthodoxy, so a big Greece before the revolution and especially the, the Greek, com Greek Orthodox communities. This is why my homeland, <laughs> Romania, is on this map, so <laughs> included into Greece because we are Greek Orthodox. But what it is interesting is that. Uh, it relates Greece uh, to Italy, uh, to Asia Minor, and to the Black Sea. And in fact, this is what it is the Northern Aegean about. It is a, a frontier reset, but for the ancient people, a frontier is necessarily a crossing zone, a control crossing zone, a difficult cross zone, but uh, nevertheless a crossing, a networking uh, zone. So my presentation will be, first of all, shortly, why the Northern Aegean, uh, then a short history of the representation of the behind the Northern Aegean region in ancient thinking to, to see what the texts are telling us about this and how can we feel it, uh, fi uh, fit it with the archaeological material. And then uh, very shortly, I want to show you two things we are doing uh, uh, in, uh, in Ainos at the mouth of the Ebros uh, uh, right now. Why well, I'm speaking of ancient geography here in front of you, most of you being archaeologists, because I think this uh, um, 
uh, ancient representation have a value, allow us in order to reconstruct the context in which uh, uh, the um, architectural monuments, let's say, or uh, um, objects in any case were elaborated and were transferred. Uh, and then because I think that the reconstruction of this environment is really essential in order to uh, do archaeology today and to give the full meaning of this uh, uh, object. So the aim of this paper at the end, I hope to convince you that this behind the northern Aegean, so from the Adriatic to the Black Sea, including the Hymos, the Balkans, uh, and uh, the Danube, it's both a frontier skip, a border zone, and the connectivity area, if we want to judge by, uh, let's say, uh, traces, archaeological traces. And if we speak in cultural terms, it is a middle ground, of course, between the sedentary civilized world of the uh, internal sea and the nomadic, uh, less civilized world, barbaric world of the steppes. And I will tell you what is about the, about the why the, the mountains, so the Carpathians and so on don't appear uh, in this uh, sketch. I will tell you about this immediately. So uh, my, my first point, why the Northern Aegean? Um, my colleagues here, specialists of architecture, look a lot at marbles. And uh, if we look at the map for sources of marbles, of course, there are a lot in the Aegean. And there are also some in the Northern Aegean, especially Tassos and Proconesos. And throughout the Northern Aegean, we can play with the exportation of, this, uh, uh, of these marbles. This is a study which is not done. I would like to have it at least uh, for Inos. We, we try to work on it, but it's uh, extremely complicated to have, to have the samples. So it is something, let's say, uh, ongoing. But we speak uh, about the connectivity and, of course, uh, the Northern Aegean since the beginning, let's say, of Greek history, uh, it is a strong point in uh, connectivity. And this goes even stronger in Hellenistic times uh, when uh, we have uh, the consequences of Alexander uh, conquest and the divisions between the Diodochi. Of course, with the Roman times, we have the roads. And I wanted to show you this map because uh, we are working in Ninos, and I will mention it shortly at the end on a branch of the Via Ignatia. And uh, this is uh, quite interesting to see how today uh, the, 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 we can find the segments and to understand that all these lines you see on these maps are in reality not the lines, but networks. So many trajectories and uh, say of uh, principal and secondary roads connected with harbors and cities. So we should change a little bit our image of uh, lines into a much more complex uh, uh, picture. And of course, uh, for this Northern Aegean, there are two big networks, I would say, of roads with, of course, important segments, but also many other secondary segments, which are the Via Diagonalis, Via Militaris, and of course, the Via Ignatia, which were used, of course, also throughout uh, the uh, medieval times. So a crossing, uh, a crossing a region, a region of exchanges, even in uh, uh, Byzantine times, and a region of uh, conflicts, uh, because if we take our period of time, so from Macedonian, from the Macedonian expansion, uh, we have uh, on uh, these uh, val river valleys mainly the uh, expeditions of Philip II, and then of course of Alexander the Great, who discovered not only the Indus <laughs> Basin, but also he is the, considered to be the explorer of the uh, Istros uh, Basins in the middle, the middle Danube uh, of today, also going up on the river valleys throughout the northern Aegean. Uh, and then with the Diadochi, of course, who probably established the most uh, extended uh, uh, territorial states uh, to, uh, to, to, to their time. Uh, a region of conflicts and the definition of the two big roads about I, uh, what I mentioned about, so Via Ignatia and uh, Via Diagonalis in the context of the end of the second century uh, BC and first century BC with the uh, Mitridatic uh, Wars. And this is how we can uh, schematize this so with the roads and the river valleys going uh, east, uh, east, west, uh, and north, uh, south uh, through the different mountain regions and through following, more better to say, the different uh, basin rivers. 
if I have to choose a, a map, a good map, uh, an ancient map of this region, I would like to choose this one. Uh, this is a map which was done, you can see it's not a hazard, in uh, um, 1453. It is preserved also in the French National Library. And uh, what you can see here is a map oriented to the north, exactly with, let's say, more or less the eastern part of our region behind the northern Aegean. The Aegean is here, and here is uh, uh, the Propontis, and until Byzantium, and here you have the Black Sea, and here you have the Danube with its uh, tributaries, and here you have the basin of the Hebros uh, with uh, some uh, tributaries. What you can see here, it's a region of full of mountains, of obstacles, uh, with some valleys uh, between the seas and the Danube, but with also with a lot of uh, castles, uh, and all this complex image, uh, which is of course for the Byzantine and medieval times valid, it's more or less uh, valid also for antiquity, it shows in any case the important elements we have to consider when we look at this region. So communication uh, in order to make exchanges, in order to make the war, and all this dependent uh, uh, on nature, so a lot of mountains difficult to cross, river valleys, river basins, seashores, and of course uh, uh, the different cities which were developed there or fortified points which were developed th uh, there over the time. So let's go in this short history of the representation of the behind the northern Aegean. Uh, for Homer, so uh, be before, let's say, the 7th uh, century uh, BC and the, 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 the Greek colonization, the Greek uh, um, uh, establishment in the Black Sea, uh, of course, uh, there is uh, more or less the ocean, so there is no clear image. So we can see this very well at the beginning of the uh, Song 13 of the Iliad when Zeus is sitting on the Ida, so more or less like this, like us on this picture, and he looks around until the edges of the world and turn away his bright eyes from the war in Troy and look afar upon the land of the Thracian horsemen. So we have some ideas about the Thracian uh, seashore until the mountains and the mission that fight in close combats. So we look uh, here, uh, let's say in the region of Chalcedon and the uh, northwestern Anatolia, uh, Asia Minor, uh, and then of the, law, um, of the Lord, the Hippemolgi, that drink the milk of the mares, and of the Abbey, the most righteous of men. So we go over the steppe to the people who use the milk of, the, uh, of, their, uh, of their animals, and the Abbey uh, totally, uh, totally um, imaginary people whose name nevertheless suggests an Iranian origin but the Greeks ne were never aware of the real meaning of the uh, ethnic. Uh, in any case, it, uh, they were translating it uh, in very various ways, referring to the people who would idealize people, utopic people uh, living without uh, violence uh, or uh, abios, an eternal life, and so on. So not much for these edges of the world in an image of the Homeric uh, um, internal sea, so Mediterranean and Black Sea again, uh, here where the ocean is very close to, to, to this. Uh, and this is exactly what Strabo says, explaining Homer, uh, that the mayor of Homer's day in general regarded the Black Sea as a kind of second Oceanus, and they thought that those who vo uh, voyaged uh, uh, got behind the limits of the inhabited world, so crossing the Bosporus, just as much as those who uh, voyaged far behind the pillars of uh, Heracles. The Pontic Sea was supposed to be the largest of the seas in our part of the world, so just a big gulf of the internal sea. This is the image which remains throughout uh, Greek and Roman antiquity, and for their reasons they called it Pontos, so the big uh, uh, sea. Now, when we try to go behind this image uh, of the end of the world in Homer, or what is behind the uh, North Aegean uh, seashore, um, and we look at the content, and we, of course, we have in the Odyssey the mentioning of the Siconians, uh, uh, we have in the Aeneid, uh, if we think of the, uh, the um, Trojan uh, uh, migration to Italy of Aeneas, the mentioning of Ainos, which was then in Roman times associated with Aeneas, and so on. What we have to understand through these myths, through the Nostoi, for the Greek returns, including Odysseus, and for the Trojan migrations, just like for the Etruscan mig migration, imaginary mi migration uh, told by Herodotus, is the connectivity east-west. And this east-west connectivity passes through the northern Aegean, on the northern Aegean uh, shore. And this is a historical archaeological reality, just like it is uh, uh, in the myth. 
uh, we are therefore in the middle, let's say, with the Aegean in the middle of this internal, uh, 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 internal sea, uh, between the end of the world, which were conceptualized in the Greek mythology uh, by Atlas. So here, at the um, Heracles. Uh, uh, stellae uh, columns and Prometheus who, were, who were, he was here in the uh, Caucasus uh, with an image which is between in fact two big straits uh, the Gibraltar and uh, here the Kerch uh, Strait which were probably mentioned already by Skilax of Carianda in the 6th century uh, BC uh, Skilax of Carianda who worked in fact for Darius the great uh, Persian uh, uh, king I have a problem with the images. So. Sorry. Um, what I wanted uh, to say is that uh, there are also, uh, unfortunately, the images are not showing up. Uh, the 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 um, uh, the region is also, uh, as you know, I told you, characterized by the ha uh, the high mountains, which are associated with Boreas, the northern wind, and with the. Yeah, and with the um, and with the Hyperboreans, so, so this is another, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mental uh, characterization of the uh, of these uh, regions. We have it from archaic times, uh, end of archaic period, with Aristeas of Proconesus behind the Black Sea and behind uh, these big mountains, which were imaginary. So going from, let's say, northern Italy uh, up to uh, Caucasus, and then uh, in the uh, uh, late classical time up to uh, Himalaya. Uh, these are so the, the Boreas and then the Rifean mountains behind which are living again utopic people uh, living a very big life just like the Homeric Abbey and these are the Hyperboreans. And uh, um, the Rifean mountains are let's say uh, more or less to the north and then uh, more and more uh, sources in Roman times are referring to the Rifeans are being in north uh, Italy. Uh, but in reality, these Rifean Rif mountains uh, are uh, quite a mythical uh, um, invention, let's say, and uh, we have all kind of explanation of what Rifean means uh, and uh, uh, what we can say. In fact, it is uh, that uh, um, they are uh, they are um, uh, coming, but un unfortunately, I don't see my images. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Something happened because all the animations uh, disappeared. What I wanted to show you here is that uh, this is uh, uh, the, the Ripean mountains are probably coming uh, through Iranian intermediary from the Mesopotamians and are the column of the world situated in the extreme north. And at some point, of course, these were associated with the Hamus in the northern Aegean. Uh, I was trying to tell you about uh, these high mountains, which are more or less conceptualized as linked to the Caucasus, analogous to the Caucasus, and uh, a land of the Hyperboreans, so the, the ones who live behind the Boreas, the Borean region, the northern region, here, idealized people all around. And I was telling you that these uh, uh, ideas of the Hyperboreans, uh, it's an old idea, maybe with uh, oriental origin, but the idea of the uh, Rifean mountain uh, behind which uh, live the Hyperboreans, so the Rife and the Northern Mountains, uh, must be borrowed, uh, it's an hypothesis I make, uh, from, uh, by the Greeks from the Persians, uh, with whom the Greeks are, of course, in contact in the 6th, 5th uh, century uh, BC due to the advancement of the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, and uh, the Persians themselves probably took, them, took it from the Mesopotamians, who had this idea that at the north, there is, of course, for the Mesopotamians, at the north, there is the Caucasus, like a uh, big axis mundi uh, from uh, uh, from on which uh, on top of which the uh, the sky uh, is uh, is setting and this must be the ultimate origin of the Rifeans uh, and of the big mountains uh, meet. But of course, all this connection, Caucasus, uh, uh, the Hamus, the Balkans, and then the Alps, 
all mixed with a very vague idea of the Carpathians, because the Carpathians are not really known and not conceptualized until uh, Jordanes, uh, Getica in uh, late antiquity. Uh, all this, you know, uh, mountain, uh, uh, mountainous axis to the north, it's a Greek invention. So Iranian sources, but finally putting together the things and uh, for analogy and symmetry, it's, it's something Greek. Another Greek invention is the invention of the continents, and we are here not far, of course, in fact, more or less on the border between Asia and Europe, uh, and uh, this continent, which for the Greek are more or less parts of the uh, Earth, so Eperoi, were um, uh, invented in the context of the confrontation with the Persians in the late 6th, 4th uh, 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 century BC. So the big uh, the distinction between Europe and Asia is passing uh, through uh, Bospori, Bosporus Thracian and Bosporus Cimmerian, but also through a series of Pontos. And as we said, the big Black Sea is the big Pontos, so it's the difficult uh, crossing. But we have also the Hellespontos, the Propontos, uh, and so on. Uh, and in the end, at the end, we don't have a Pontos, we have a Limne, uh, because uh, the Asia, uh, Azov Sea was thought to be a kind of big delta for the Black Sea, and the Black Sea it itself could have been thought as a corpus, as a gulf, uh, which would be finally filled by the delta of all the big uh, Pontic uh, rivers. Uh, a frontier between Europe and Asia invented, so at the end of the 6th century and the beginning of the 5th century uh, BC by the Greeks, it's something that we do not find uh, in any other uh, oriental vision of the world. So there are no continents, there is a big sea for the internal sea, there is a uh, focus on the Near East, but uh, nor the Mesopotamians, nor the Egyptians, nor the Iranians have continents. This is only for the Greeks, and then if it goes uh, uh, on, it is only from Hellenistic times and uh, more or less from uh, uh, from Alexandria that, it, uh, uh, that the others take this idea of, uh, let's say, parts of the world. And it is, of course, a geographical uh, setting, a geographical frame, but also a political frame, because in our region, behind the Northern Aegean, we have the Persians, uh, and we have them not only coming here, so we have it, uh, of course, until Macedonia, uh, but also we know here, thanks to the discovery of this inscription in uh, Phanagor, uh, on the other side through the Caucasus uh, uh, around the Black, uh, the Black Sea. So this shows that uh, Darius, uh, this inscription from Phanagoria, uh, shows that Darius and his son uh, uh, Xerxes continued what Cyrus already started, so a conquest which goes east and west, but which goes uh, here through Armenia and the Caucasus to the northern Black Sea, just as it goes here uh, to the west uh, through our, uh, our northern uh, Aegean. And this means that our story in Herodotus about uh, the Black Sea with a big Persian campaigns is more or less an invention of uh, what it was in fact two uh, campaigns of Darius around the Black Sea, one going freer through the Caucasus and the other going here until today, uh, Ukraine. So in any case, we are on spaces which despite the division Europe versus Asia, East versus West, are coming together in a key historical moment. And the idea of the Greek uh, historians in general is not so fixed, uh, despite their efforts to make geometry in order to make a clear mental image uh, of these spaces. And if we read carefully Herodotus, we can come up with uh, an image of people who are nevertheless related one to the other, either through a, a mythical uh, ge genealogy or through exchanges. And of course, we have the Greeks with the Thracians, with the Agathiers, with the Scythians, and so on. So in this northern Aegean, despite the relief and despite the division between the worlds, we are nevertheless in a connective uh, area. And this is well arranged by Herodotus also in the uh, geography, because he is, so to say, an inventor of the uh, Istros uh, River. As you know, he says that it takes uh, the source from uh, um, a city Pirene. Uh, which must be, it must be something like a confusion uh, for Nampurias in uh, in Spain, uh, but in reality, geography uh, archaeology never confirmed the existence of direct contacts throughout the uh, uh, Isros Basin uh, more than Austria. So when we try to follow Greek objects, we never 
arrive more than, let's say, uh, Argesh or Desos in the uh, Danube Basin. And then we try to see the connection, the indirect connection, transferring uh, uh, objects which are culturally related. So in this, uh, let's say, big Thracian uh, hinterland, before the arrival of the Celts, we never go farther to the west than Baden-Baden and Austria. So all this is nevertheless a, com uh, um, a, a synthesis made by the Greek sources of Herodotus, probably also by Herodotus himself, who heard a lot of names and tried to put some order uh, into it, constructing a, a east-west Eastros, which was perfectly symmetrical to the Nile, which was flowing also north-west-east uh, 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 for Herodotus, and then all the tributaries, because Herodotus was knowing only about, let's say, Balkan, so Haimus Rodope um, uh, mountains. Uh, uh, this is why he put all the uh, tributaries he heard of, the Istros, uh, or nearly all, uh, like flying, uh, flowing from uh, south to the north because he was not aware of the existence of the Carpathians. So it's, it's a different, uh, uh, it's a mix. Uh, images due to the fact that Herodotus tried to make sense of uh, uh, this northern Aegean uh, space. However, the idea of an Istros like a channel uh, between east and west, in particular between Ad Adriatic at some point and the Black Sea, so people were continuing to, to think that uh, the Istros takes its source either very far away in, uh, in the west, either to the north, either in an ocean, either in a, a lake, either on a mountain. But it should have be, had uh, two mouths, uh, one in the Adriatic, so in the region of Istria, Istria Istros. So it's, uh, uh, this is due both to linguistic and also to the Karstic uh, uh, relief of the northern uh, Adriatic, where people were not really able to identify correctly the tributaries and the river basins. Uh, and uh, the Black Sea. And this idea of a channel, so doubling the northern big mountains, the Balkans, appears very clearly since Aristotle, so history of animals, then in Sculax, we mentioned at the beginning, in Theopompus, Aeschylus, uh, uh, even Aeschylus, but it is a fragment, uh, so it's not so sure. But let's say if it is not 5th century, really 4th century, we are sure that the Danube was considered, the Istros was considered as uh, the channel between the Black Sea uh, and the uh, Adriatic, so like a very, uh, and the, uh, and the very far away frontier. And of course, you all know that this is a, a very ma a major um, uh, geographical element in Apollonius Argonautica, uh, who offers a circumnavigation of the Oikumene in a Ptolemaic uh, perspective, so in order to show that the Ptolemies deserve to be masters of all this uh, earth. Uh, why? Because um, in particular, Ptolemaeus the second and Ptolemaeus the, uh, the third, uh, because uh, there are uh, uh, there is a mention in the uh, Argonautica in the fourth book about the fact that the um, Argonauts, after going to Colchis, in fact, they had access to Egyptian maps, and this means, of course, the Egyptians plus Greeks uh, were the first to make all this uh, periplus not only through Europe and around Italy, but also here through Africa. So this is more or less what the uh, Ptolemies were willing as their empire. And uh, of course, a very nice discovery published in 2019 uh, on the Oxyrexus papyrus with a, a boat with the Argonauts uh, crossing uh, here in, uh, crossing here rather here in uh, Libya uh, with their uh, boat. So Ptolemaic Empire on the Danube and then Roman Empire because the Romans were the ones to identify the Danube with the Istros. And uh, this Danube was first constructed like a double of the Rhine in the north, in Germany. And then uh, the first uh, clear attestation of the fact that the Danube and the Istros are uh, only one river uh, comes from Augustus in the Monumentum Ancuranum. And it is confirmed by Ovid in the same time and uh, by Strabo and well explained by Pliny some decades later. So we have to wait to the end of the first century BC in order to know that uh, the Danube and the Istros are the same and that that the Istros are, is taking uh, its uh, water so somewhere near the Rhine. Sometimes it was even confused, confused to mix with the Rhine. In any case, uh, somewhere uh, to the north. 
And this brings us, of course, to Ptolemy, which gives a, quite a good image, and he has very good information about the whole um, uh, the Danube basin, uh, because uh, he, uh, his geography is nourished by information uh, of the first century uh, a, uh, AD. I was mentioning the network of people and the connections, and I wanted to just uh, in order to finish with these representations to make, uh, uh, to make um, um, a short recall of a research I, I, I was doing in the last years with uh, Consuela Maneta, our colleagues, uh, in order to see how these uh, myths and literary representations uh, are depending on uh, realities, on geography, on uh, and on archaeological representation, on archaeological monuments. And I, I, I want to mention here, so uh, for the Hellenistic time, the, the example of the Tauropolos. Uh, this is a, a goddess which is well attested in uh, uh, Macedonia, which was, of course, identified with uh, uh, the Artemis, uh, the one uh, uh, who had to do with Iphigenia in classical times, so between Beotia and Attica, who is also attested in Megara and Peloponnesus, so, so an Artemis Tauropolos, and who in Hellenistic times from Macedonia uh, spreads we uh, well in Asia Minor, especially to the west, uh, but also in uh, Mithridatic times to the east, the northeast of Asia Minor, uh, and uh, which in uh, Roman times uh, it's related with a cult of uh, uh, Diana uh, in uh, Nemi. Uh, why so? Because the generals, the Roman generals, in particular the Luculi coming back from the uh, Mithridatic uh, uh, wars are revendicating, are taking over uh, the gods and all this uh, literary mythological representation uh, Mithridates could have used in his propaganda uh, when uh, using the Macedonian Tauropolis uh, spreading so in north uh, um, eastern Anatolia, uh, well attested also in the Black Sea in order to construct his Pontic Empire and then export it finally to the Romans in order to show their power over the Pontic Empire. I'm finishing, and I'm really finishing now, with the, um, I hope they will uh, function, two small uh, uh, movies, examples uh, uh, of what we are doing in Ainos and where I'm trying to, to, to use uh, uh, all this um, geographical, let's say, and literary uh, information m more directly related with uh, uh, archaeology. And in fact, if you want uh, my opinion about the geography of this northern Aegean, if there is a, a way in order to make sense of all this uh, region, leaving aside the um, very complicated names which were never uh, associated with the same realities, because all these geographical realities are in fact socially constructed realities, so there are no coherent Balkans, uh, let's say, until the 19th century, there are no, uh, uh, there, uh, even the Danube, you saw, which was constructed and reconstructed in various time in antiquity, and the situation is even more complicated with the rivers. However, if we go on the field, the basin rivers can, despite their various names and identifications, can serve as uh, landmarks or watermarks, let's say, for us in order to understand how this whole region functions. So if you ask me how to define the coherence of this region or how to explain it, I would say that it is indeed a frontier, a borderland, a frontier scape, which is for ancient people very well related with connectivity. Any border zone, frontier zone, it must be connected. Uh, and uh, then the best connectivity is, of course, water connectivity uh, through rivers and sea. And for this, Ainos is a very complicated but good example because it controlled the, the access to the Hebros River, so the biggest uh, basin of all this uh, northern Aegean uh, space. And you have an image of what is Ainos uh, today in Turkey. And uh, here I wanted to show you a small reconstruction of what we did uh, with geoarchaeology, geophysics, geomorphology, and our colleagues are helping uh, us. Uh, we cannot see it on the big screen yet. Um, so yeah, we uh, 
uh, thanks to the work of uh, geophysicists and geomorphologists from Germany, Kiel University, Köln University, and of the archaeologists, we have tried to reconstruct a road uh, of Xerxes describing Herodotus with the landscape which was uh, uh, which could have been there. So based on what. Uh, um, uh, archaeology and uh, geomorphology is telling us. So this is how Xerxes would have taken a boat and uh, seeing Samothrace far away, uh, went to Ainos uh, and then looking for Doriscos, the big plain where he gathered uh, all his uh, troops uh, before, uh, uh, before invading Greece and after having crossed uh, to, to Europe. So after the crossing of the Hellespont, we arrive uh, we crossed the uh, Melas Gulf, so separating Kersonesos from uh, uh, the territory of Ainos, and we see Ainos here as it should have been looked uh, in the 5th century BC, uh, so like a peninsula. It was uh, before, in Neolithic times, it was even an island, but now it was a peninsula at the mouth of the river, which was still far away, the delta was still far away, so it was a big maritime gulf, very wide, in order to put a lot of ships on this plain of Doriscos, where we are uh, working now, which is really indeed a plain as uh, the Herodotus describes it, so Aigalos, because uh, last year uh, in October we worked there and we can see that Doric's coast could not have a big harbor and it was a very difficult uh, place in order to have protective harbors, but all we have uh, there and which is now covered by the delta is this Aigalos, uh, this uh, plain. So our Ainos in front of this was always the political and military uh, center, which had Doris cost only, let's say, like a, a secondary uh, first uh, foundation and a military place and then a, a small city. And Ainos, which was, of course, found by the Aeolians, so we are in the most western point of the Aeolis, uh, with uh, this big territory which allowed the people from Ainos to have also stones to construct, uh, but also the, an enough place to make agriculture and to look every day at Samothrace, as all we were all, all always doing uh, while working in Turkey. And this is how we imagine, imagine uh, Doriscos, where we hope we could work in the future in collaboration with Chris Akaradima and Demnater Zopulu. Uh, and here is how uh, we could see it from the uh, Hebros uh, uh, with uh, some valleys that we are trying next year to investigate with the colleagues in uh, Kiel and the Turkey on the Turkish side. So again, the peninsula and uh, what we could establish for after more than 10 years of geomorphological, geoarchaeological work uh, is that uh, indeed around this peninsula we have at least two, two important harbors. The one uh, which is uh, here is the oldest harbor and uh, all around there are necropolis uh, from archaic to Byzantine times and here we have a harbor which was developed uh, star, uh, and uh, really constructed uh, only from uh, uh, Justinian times from 6th century uh, AD and then with very strong uh, Byzantine and uh, Genovese and Ottoman modifications. We have based our research on all kind of palynological, uh, so these are not pure inventions, but are based on the seeds and on the pollens. We can we could see in the drills, um, and uh, this is our story. And the very last thing I would like to show you. Uh, inside Ainos, so this uh, city of Hermes at the cross uh, uh, at the crossroad. Uh, of different civilizations. We have, uh, uh, no, we don't have many monuments in Aino, so we have to go underground in order to find something ancient. Otherwise, the uh, strong uh, occupation uh, throughout three millennia don't, don't, do not leave uh, uh, many traces, just like uh, some small fragments I will show you immediately after. And um, uh, we have uh, studied this uh, uh, cave, uh, which was called the Pan Cave, and which has a history going back for Greek classical times until the 20th uh, century. And I was trying to show a movie, but uh, uh, maybe we will go on the uh, sketch fab and try, if, uh, even if I don't know if it is uh, possible to show you so some fragments. This is what we are doing now in Ainos. We have made photogrammetry and we are publishing uh, uh, this year a corpus of all the uh, sculpted materials. So uh, uh, with all kind of uh, also architectural fragments starting from the six, uh, uh, end 6th uh, uh, century uh, BC uh, to uh, Roman and Byzantine times. You can see here a mixture. 
And I uh, don't know if with this computer I am able, I wanted to, no, I will probably not be able. I wanted to take, uh, to take you to a, tra to a trip inside uh, this, uh, maybe I am able. This is 3D model of this uh, cave I was telling you about. So you can see it uh, here. Uh, we are now in Ainos. So, oh, but, uh, yeah, maybe we can advance. So going into the cave, we can see, uh, we should have seen. Okay. You can see, you can play it. Oh, it's free online. We did not publish it yet, but we, had, we wanted to put it online. So here it is the entry uh, with some, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, archaic reliefs. So you can see it here now. Oh, sorry, here. You can see it here. Not archaic, but classical relief with probably pan and the nymphs. Uh, and then uh, this is like a trace of uh, Greek times. And then if we go slowly into the cave, uh, we can see how it was reworked in Byzantine times bef uh, by the 11th, 12th century. These are uh, C14 dates. Uh, with uh, like a funerary chapels, uh, with a small uh, altar here, and with some uh, fresco, the, cha the funerary chapels, which is uh, maybe somehow surprising for some. It was uh, consecrated to Mary, and we can see here a uh, uh, Nikon of uh, Mary and the child. I'm sorry, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, and uh, there are around several other representations of uh, Mary. This uh, chapel is in such a bad status, so there are bone, bones all over the place, and we are waiting now for the results from ge uh, for uh, genetics. Uh, it's uh, such a terrible, uh, in such a terrible status, uh, still after restoration, because it was used uh, in Turkish times, so after the Greek left the city in 1923, uh, it, is, uh, used, it was used uh, uh, for a metallurgic workshop. So every Everything is quite destroyed, but we try to put together the pieces. And uh, I hope uh, by the end of this year, as you can see it by yourself on this uh, sketch fab, uh, you would be able to see uh, some of the uh, remains uh, from uh, Ainos. Uh, the, the pieces which are can could be taken are now in the Edirne Museum, and there we could have work. We could work uh, uh, thanks to Shahan Kirchun, the director of the Edirne Museum, with Said Basharan and my colleague uh, Frederic Marchand Beaulieu. Thank you very much. Sorry for all the problems in the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Now I push the button. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, I, uh, th maybe those in the room heard that I just was uh, saying uh, thank you to Anka for a, a brilliant presentation that was uh, uh, polymathic and um, and sweeping and interesting in placing the Northern Aegean as both a connective and a liminal place. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, very happy to uh, open the floor to questions. Thank you for a really fascinating presentation. I'm wondering uh, about the, the sort of mental map that the Romans would have had of this area. I mean, are they thinking of it as coming up from Greece or are they thinking of it as coming over from Italy and how does that change the way that they might conceive of contacting peoples, for example? Thank you. So the Romans were coming, of course, uh, from the Hellenistic world. So they were really going on Hellenistic traces. And in the case of the Danube, uh, they are going on the traces uh, so opened by Philip and Alexander for the Middle uh, Danube Basin. And then using all the uh, river basins which were uh, used uh, in previous times, so especially since uh, late Macedonian times, so late classical times. Uh, these big roads, nevertheless, even if they correspond, of course, to traces, and you know very well, the Via Ignatia, so uh, uh, roads, let's say, uh, paths which were used from historical times, so following the Northern Aegean for the Ignatia Via, and uh, then following the maritime gulfs and the river, uh, the rivers, and then 
the Via Diagonalis or Via Militaris to the north. Even if they go, of course, on ancient paths, the Romans are the first to construct something. In Ainos, um, it's uh, interesting because we could see the continuation of uh, this Via Ignatia. As you know, the Via Ignatia is mentioned uh, uh, as more or less stopping to this uh, Hebros River, which is very broad at the mouth in the de delta, which is uh, nearly 20 kilometers bright, so this uh, ancient gulf. And uh, we do not know anything. So uh, Strabo is quoting Polybius, and we don't know what happened with uh, Via Ignatia after Ipsala. And we know that uh, also Ovid stopped there, went to Samothrace to make an initiation, and then he mentions the Samothracian Perea, and he said that somehow he wanted to continue on foot uh, going to uh, to Thomas uh, while he is uh, narrating another periplus. So it's uh, it's well, quite quite complicated. But around Ainos we have roads, Roman roads, and we are not really able to date them because we can see only the stones. Uh, but um, ne not far away from Ainos, so maybe if I go back to the PowerPoint, do I have the right to go to the map of Ainos? Can can we uh, see please the PowerPoint? Sorry. Uh, not far from Ainos, so uh, like 10 kilometers from modern Ainos, we can go uh, down. Uh, no, uh, yes, we are before that. Uh, 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 please go uh, to the end of the, yes, there. So you should see now a map. Uh, 10 kilometers from, uh, from Ainos, following what is now the Hebros River, uh, we have found uh, uh, traces uh, of what could be uh, the first uh, archaeological attested station of, uh, um, uh, let's say, on the Via Ignatia network, and it is in the natural reserve of uh, Galagolu. And uh, we could, uh, I, I think I would, su I have suggested uh, this uh, date in the first century AD, so after Strabo, this means that Strabo is right and Polybius is right, Via Ignatia really stopped in the construction in the first century uh, BC uh, here at the Hebros, and there was a, a intense activity of Roman construction uh, in the time of Nero, which is well attested epigraphically. We have like five inscriptions mentioning uh, uh, stations and military station on a Via Militaris in Nero's uh, time, so in the years 60 of the first century AD, uh, and then this probably uh, traces of station with uh, Roman roads here going up to the actual city of uh, Enes. Uh, uh, should be dated to the first century AD. So what I wanted to say is that the Romans, yeah, took over what it was from history. So the paths on the valleys, the paths near the coast, the navigation, and so on, but also constructed themselves the roads uh, in order to to uh, be able to to make the conquest and to for yeah to to, to support their their advancement to the north. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, but of course, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I just was curious about the line of the Limes and how it comes down, you know, it comes down from the north, it comes down from Germany. And, um, you know, Marcus Aurelius is up with the Macromani up in that area as well. So they, they come in from the north and then come down as well as going across Greece, right? This is something which happens in the time of Augustus, and Professor Eck was the first to say that, in fact, Augustus uh, uh, imagined this limes, and this is why I think also, agreeing with Professor Eck, uh, that um, uh, the, the construction, the, the connection between the Danubius River, which was known to be related to the Rhine, so just like the Rhine, near the Rhine, and the Easter River, which was to the Black Sea, this was a theoretical connection at the beginning for the Romans, and it's a theory which uh, was in agreement with what Augustus probably himself imagined as the Roman limes, so coming both from Germany and also from the Northern Aegean and the Black Sea. And this is why they hypothesized that the two rivers could be one, just like the, uh, of course, uh, classical people imagine that uh, the ba Danube and the Adriatic, the B Black Sea and the Adriatic were related by the Istros. All these are mental constructions in order to justify power. We saw that with Apollonius of Rhodos, this was the Ptole Ptolemaic Empire. With Augustus, we have the Roman Empire and the Limes. But it was true that the Danubius was uh, the Easter, but still at the beginning was a theoretical hypothesis, which, uh, it, which is proven and then uh, uh, really used uh, military in the first century 
century AD when we have the time of real construction of the and then conquest of course Vespasian is another important moment and of course Trajan in Dacia what we don't know what is missing in this picture is we don't know much about the geography of Dacia and of the Trajan campaigns over the Danube we have of course inscriptions uh, uh, we, we know about the Apollodorus bridge of uh, from later sources until Procopius we know that uh, a channel was constructed by, by this inscription and so on by on the Iskar but um, we don't um, uh, we don't know what Trajan knew about the geography of what was behind the Danube and we are surprised not to have any information about the Carpathians which of course he crossed so behind the Danube remains a little bit like on Tabula Peutingeriana something which is not described and of course the roads are quite rare in that uh, region Thank you, Anka, for this wonderful talk. I'm, I'm particularly interested in this uh, late you know, part of your talk when you spoke about Ainos. And I'm wondering uh, if you can tell us a bit more about the context of the finds in that cave. And I was particularly struck by the early capitals and what is their you know, set. I mean, do we know anything about this? This was very, uh, of course, you know, I think that this is uh, a rich part of your work that you try to provide this overview. And I th maybe you glossed over a bit at the end. Can tell us a bit more. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we have to finish the project this year in uh, Aino, so we are now publishing uh, the results. So this cave is in the middle of the modern city. It is down the what we call Acropolis or Burg, the fortified uh, uh, city here. Uh, there are many, uh, so the, this the Kalkar uh, uh, bedrock in Ainos is very soft, so it is easy to make cave. There are quite a lot, especially from Byzantine times uh, uh, and then Ottoman times. People were living there, probably also in antiquity. We have a lot of mentions in Hellenistic times, for example, Ikrofron mentioned caves and Hecate cults and so on, uh, not only on this side of the Hebrews, but also on the other side in the Samothracian uh, Perea. Uh, so caves are nothing unusual. What is interesting in this cave is here. So we are getting uh, in now here like that. And uh, here is this uh, pan and the nymphs uh, relief, which is really damaged. But we can still uh, guess that it is something maybe from the fourth century uh, BC. This is why I was interested in this cave. And I think that they extended in Byzantine times. Uh, by C14, we have uh, uh, dates of the 11th, 12th century. The frescoes were made several times. They are badly damaged, but uh, um, they must be so after the f shape of the Theotokos from the 14th century. But the bones are in the tombs, which are unfortunately mixed, and we try to put some pieces together by genetics now. We are waiting for results. So the people buried here uh, were already uh, buried in the 11th century, so much older than the frescoes. And then this uh, funerary chapel were used in, fun in Byzantine times uh, and uh, with other wood uh, arrangement inside because we have uh, C14 dates on wood, on like sarcophagi or things which were decorating the place uh, from the 17th century uh, AD. And as I told you, it was totally destroyed in the 12 uh, 20th century when they made the uh, workshop, metallurgic workshop. And you can see here, in fact, they used this and there was a lot of smoke uh, in order to get out the, the, the smoke uh, on this side. So this is about the cave. Uh, it, it was uh, traditionally called from the uh, beginning of the 20th century by the Greeks living still in Ainos between uh, before 1923, like Pan Cave. So they knew something about this relief uh, that it belonged to, to, to Pan. And then it was also new as belonging to Agia Triada, so in Byzantine uh, times. Uh, this is about the, the, the cave, uh, then uh, um, what we are doing, and you can see, uh, mm, I can give you the, the address if you want to look on Sketchfab, some models are in open uh, access, uh, and uh, we put them uh, here, and we are publishing them in a book in uh, French and Turkish, uh, hopefully this year. So there are all kind of architectural elements, as you can see. So these are very well known for eolic uh, capitals, which are already published for many, uh, several decades by Said Basharan. Uh, they have good parallels in Izmir. 
and they are in Kalkarus, probably locally Kalkar. Uh, so Ainos was an Aeolic city and there is absolutely no problem with that. Sixth century BC, we are still in an Aeolic world. Uh, then we can have all kinds of fragments which are unfortunately never found uh, in, um, in an archaeological context. They were, you know, given by people who are making agriculture around and they were brought to the Edirne Museum. And uh, we try to put them together, including with pieces uh, which, uh, yeah, about which we knew and also some pieces in the Louvre because <laughs> I, I found also like two uh, uh, funerary reliefs in the Louvre coming from Ainos, so everybody picked something uh, from there, <laughs> passing by. And uh, yeah, what uh, we can see, so besides this uh, very uh, diverse architectural fragments of all times, I told you there are many Roman pieces and Byzantine pieces of all kinds of columns and capitals or even architectural decorations like that. Uh, um, we have reliefs, uh, we have uh, pieces of funerary monuments, uh, we have statues. Um, of different qualities, mostly of Roman times. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, most of them without provenance. So uh, we, it just shows the destruction, but we still try to put them together and to show for, by small pieces the huge diversity and the richness that uh, Ainos should have had despite uh, decay, let's say, in Hellenistic times, uh, but the reinforcements of the city in Roman times. So Ainos was strong in archaic times. It was still rich in classical times. We have a huge, Said Basharan, through his excavation, has a huge quantity of Attic material of the best quality in the necropolis. And of course, it is the only, and there are, these are the only necropolis known from Eastern Trace. So this can be also a factor which temporized, but we, in any case, a lot of Attic material. Uh, and then uh, something like, uh, more regional, let's say, in Hellenistic times, and coming again uh, strongly in Roman times with uh, uh, reurbanization, with uh, urban villas, with mosaics, of course, not so nice, but uh, still <laughs> urban life. Uh, and then uh, a new reinforcement in the sixth century with uh, Justinian, with the construction of the walls, and so a reconstruction of the walls, and, uh, and so on. Yeah, I don't know if I answer. <laughs> Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, other questions from the, the floor? I just have one, Anka, if I might, uh, um, about geography. And you mentioned the, the extraordinary width of the, op of the um, mouth of the Hebrus River. And I was wondering if, um, in, in relationship to the Danube and in scale, uh, is, is the Hebrus anywhere near as navigable? I mean, is it wide but navigable? Or at what point does it cease to be? navigable, does it go all the way up through the center of, of uh, modern Bulgaria? It was uh, at least until Plovdiv, I think. In any case, it was until the 19th century, it was navigable until Edirne, Adrianopolis, so in Turkey. Uh, and then some uh, parts, or in any case, I think in antiquity, maybe probably until Plovdiv. And then by the tributaries, some of the tributaries were navigable, but of course we have to deal with seasons uh, and with uh, different climatic changes uh, over the years. And we also have to make clear with what it was navigable. What we know from Ariane is that the Thracians were using monoxyla, including on the rivers, so in the context of the Alexander conquest. So probably uh, most of the tributaries up to very high um, in the Rila mountains, so the Ebros is coming uh, from the Rila, uh, were navigable. If not uh, navigable with ships, at least, they were certainly doing, and this is the case uh, throughout Bulgaria and Romania until the 20th century, they were uh, letting the wood float, float on the river, and it is still something because, of course, trash was an important source of uh, wood. Uh, for uh, shipbuilding and in, yeah, this is something we can see very well by uh, palynological studies and charcoal analysis. The Greeks uh, made uh, huge <laughs> fires when they arrived in the 7th century BC uh, and then with the Romans we have really uh, huge destruction with the urban way of life. This is what we see in, uh, in Ainos. But yes, uh, so uh, Hebros uh, really the biggest highway, let's say, just like the Danube, navigable until the 19th century. The difference is that, of course, the progradation of the Delta in the late 19th and uh, then 20th century uh, was uh, doubled by the irrigations for the rice fields in Turkey, 
and uh, yeah, also the deforestation which continued and the uh, pasturing and all this brings sediments into the delta and transformed the Bigos River into something which has very small water today if we go. Uh, there are two channels with quite a small part of water and of course all this is also after the 1950s with the development of the agriculture on both the, the, the Turkish and the Greek side in the delta. So there are uh, fields with rice and cotton. But uh, otherwise, yeah, until the 19th century, no problem to go to Edirne by a big boat from Izmir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if there are other questions, or if there are not other questions, uh, formally, we can informally um, uh, adjourn to a reception. And again, uh, Anka, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>